Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Pamela Mamer, and today I'm here to discuss the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program Technical Assistance Webinar. And with me today are my two colleagues. Let's introduce first Carla White. Carla? Hi, I'm Carla White, and I joined the Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad team a little over a month ago, and I'm looking forward to working with you all. Amy? Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Marion. I'm a program officer here on the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad, or DDRA program. This is my second year working on the DDRA, and I'm looking forward to getting the technical assistance webinar started right now and telling you a little bit more about the fiscal year 2023 uh, competition. So I'm actually going to turn my camera off until later, and we're going to dive right in. So thank you all for joining us, and here we go. So to begin, just a couple of basics. Our contact information is ddra at ed.gov. So if you have any questions after reviewing this webinar, please contact Pamela, Carla, and myself at ddra at ed.gov. And the application deadline is April 11th, 2023. And we will reiterate that several times throughout the presentation. The objectives of today's webinar include an overview of the DDRA program, a description of the pre-award process, a description of the application review process and application tips. We'll also provide some details on additional information, an upcoming live question and answer session, and other contact details. To get us started, we wanted to provide a brief overview of the Fulbright programs in the International and Foreign Language Education Office, also known as IFL, here at the U.S. Department of Education. So the Fulbright Hayes program was established in 1961 and Eiffel currently administers four Fulbright Hayes programs, including the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad program, which we will refer to throughout the presentation as the DDRA. So a little bit more on the background, the Fulbright Hayes Act of 1961 is officially known as the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act of 1961. It was marshaled by United States Senator J. William Fulbright and enacted by the 87th United States Congress on September 21st, 1961. The international education programs, including the Peace Corps, were originally created under the National Defense Education Act and then incorporated into the Higher Education Act. Section 102B6 of the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act, or Fulbright Hayes, created an overseas component to the otherwise domestically based international education programs under Title VI. To date, we have had over 6,000 fellows funded with the Fulbright Hayes DDRA. Final approval of award recommendations are given by the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. A little bit more about the DDRA fellowship. The Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program is designed to contribute to the development and improvement of the study of modern foreign languages and area studies in the United States by providing opportunities for scholar, scholars to conduct research abroad. For the purpose of this program, area studies is defined as an interdisciplinary program of comprehensive study of the aspects of a society or societies, including the study of their geography, history, culture, economy, politics, education, international relations, and language. Since area studies is broadly defined, we have had students in many different disciplines apply every year. DDRA is an annual competition, so we run it every year, and is an institutional grant that awards fellowships to research scholars. The institution is awarded a grant for 18 months from October 1st of the year to March 31st, 18 months later. So for example, this year, October 1st, 2023 to March 31st, 2025. A scholar must travel for a minimum of six months and a maximum of 12 consecutive months. This program is intended to provide assistance to students who are well on their way to becoming area specialists. This program is not for someone who wants a new experience or has never been abroad in the field. This program is not suited for folks who want a new experience or have never been abroad in the field. The U.S. Student Program, which is funded by the State Department and organized by the Institute of International Education, might be more appropriate for scholars who would be new to conducting research abroad. Applications must be submitted electronically via the U.S. Department of Education's G5E application system, which we will talk a little bit more about in a couple of minutes. So essentially how the DDRA works, just as a recap, 
the eligible applicant is an institution of higher education. So if you're listening and you are a doctoral student, your institute of higher education is the eligible applicant and you would be eligible for a fellowship. So um, as you can see on the screen, US citizens or nationals permanent residents, um, if you're a graduate student in good standing and at a US institution of higher education. So institutions outside of the United States are not eligible applicants for the DDRA. As I mentioned previously, the project period is 18 months and the research period, a minimum of six months and a maximum of 12 months, and it must be consecutive. So you cannot go to the field for three months, come home for three months, and then go back for three months. We'd also like to talk a little bit about travel information and where we currently stand. The pandemic obviously has caused some challenges over the last several years, but we are fortunate to say that things are settling down at the moment. So just some updates on how that might look for travel. The DDRA travel period will be from January 1st, 2024 to December 31st, 2024. So keep that in mind when you are drafting your proposals and understanding if this is the correct timeline for you to be conducting your research. Travel may only be permitted with a grant activation request, which is a form at the U.S. Department of Education, which applicants would work with their institutional project directors to submit a GAR will not be approved if a, if a country is not open to fellows. No DDRA travel will be permitted before January 1st. Only countries accepting fellows will be approved. So again, um, the COVID restrictions are definitely less than they were. However, there are still some restrictions. So this is mainly what we're talking about there. Um, but there are other things that pop up that might influence if fellows are allowed to travel to a country. And of course, these things change all the time. Research periods are, may not be less than six months or more than 12 consecutive months per grant period. And this one's really important. There are no deferrals in the DDRA. So if you were to be awarded a DDRA fellowship this year and you had a different fellowship come through, uh, you would not be able to defer the award. So do keep that in mind as you are working on your application and figuring out if this is the correct time for you to be applying for the DDRA. And noting again that the travel dates would be January 1st, 2024 to December 31st, 2024. A couple of res resources that we'd like to also note for traveling and also COVID-19. First and foremost, uh, we require all of our DDRA fellows to enroll in the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, or STEP, which is run by the U.S. Department of State. You can also find country information utilizing the U.S. Department of State's travel website. So anything about current COVID information or entry exit requirements, visa requirements, current uh, status of anything going on in the country or countries that you wish to conduct research in. Along the same lines, we also have the link to the travel advisories, which are also provided by the State Department. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, the situation overseas can change rapidly, whether that's a natural disaster, political unrest, or anything like that. So we do recommend DDRA fellows and their project directors are accessing these resources. And lastly, we also have the CDC information up there, which is especially important for COVID, but also um, other health concerns and making sure that you are uh, reviewing that information and making sure that you are compliant with any sort of COVID restrictions or, you know, if you need to get a booster shot or whatever it might be, uh, making sure that you're handling those things prior to travel or ensuring that you have access to those resources while you're abroad. Okay, for fiscal year 2023, we have several competition priorities for the DDRA. We have one absolute priority and we have three competitive priorities. The absolute priority is related to geographic area. The department will only consider applications that meet the absolute priority. This priority is a research project that focuses on one or more of the following ge geographic areas, Africa, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands, South Asia, the Near East, Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia, and the Western Hemisphere, excluding the United States and its territories. So pay very close attention to the absolute priority and keep in mind that if your research project does not fall within those geographic regions, it would be ineligible to receive DDRA funding. We have three competitive preference priorities. These were updated last year. The first priority is a focus on less commonly taught languages, also known as LICTLs, a research project that focuses on any modern foreign language except 
French, German, or Spanish would receive two points for the competitive preference priority. The second competitive preference priority is a thematic focus on academic fields. This is also worth two points. So a research project conducted in the field of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, computer science, education, including comparative or international education, international development, political science, public health, or economics. So competitive preference priority, again, is worth, the, the second one is worth two points. And lastly, the third competitive preference priority, which was new in 2022, and we're um, excited to be offering this competitive preference priority. Again, this year is a special emphasis on projects implemented by one of the following entities. So historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions, or tribal colleges and universities. And this is also worth two points. For fiscal year 2023 funds and awards, this is an overview of our expected funding for this year's competition. So estimated available funds, $3,408,863. The estimated range of awards, anywhere from $15,000 to approximately $60,000. Estimated average size of awards, $37,876,000 and the estimated number of awards is 90. Please note that the department is not bound by any estimates in this notice. Okay, eligibility for grant funding. So only institutions of higher education or IHEs are eligible to apply. So each institutional applicant must appoint a DDRA project director who assumes the responsibility to register as the project director, for their university in, G5, in the G5E application system, which we will cover in more detail later. Project directors must advise and guide individual student applications, submit the entire application to the US Department of Education, administer the grant and disperse the funds if awarded the grant, and serve as the point of contact for all that institution's fellows, regardless of research topic. So, Essentially, if you're listening to this webinar and you are a doctoral student wishing to apply to the DDRA, please note that you will need to connect with your institution's DDRA project director. If your institution does not have a project director, you may be able to talk to the administration and find a project director in the Office of um, graduate studies or student affairs, depending on your institution. But it's really important that you connect with the project director as soon as possible. There are two parts of the application. One is the institutional application and the other is the fellow application. So you have to work with the project director. And if anyone listening um, has any challenges figuring out who that might be, you can email ddra at ed.gov. And also we will be posting our application booklet, which also includes a list of project directors. Okay, so eligibility for the DDRA fellowship. A student is eligible to receive a DDRA fellowship if the student is a citizen or national of the United States or is a permanent resident of the United States. Students who are J-1 visa holders are not eligible for a DDRA fellowship. If a student is a graduate student in good standing at an eligible institution of higher education when the fellowship period begins, is admitted to a candidate is admitted to candidacy in a doctoral program in modern foreign languages and area studies at the, that institution. A student is eligible if they are planning a teaching career in the United States upon graduation or plans to use language skills in the world air, in world areas vital to US national security and knowledge of these countries in, in fields of government, international development and various professions. And Eligible applicants should possess adequate skills in foreign languages necessary to carry out their dissertation research project. DDRA and the Fulbright US Student Program. So this is really important for anybody who is interested in also applying for the Fulbright US Student Program, which we previously mentioned is funded by the US Department of State and administered by the Institute of International Education. So as stated in the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board policy, no applicant may receive concurrently a grant from the Fulbright U.S. Student Program and a grant from the Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program. An applicant to the DDRA program must indicate on their application to the program if they have currently applied for a Fulbright U.S. Student IIE grant. 
once a candidate has accepted an award from the Fulbright U.S. student program and they have extended funds to the student, then they are not eligible for the DDRA grant. And if at any point a candidate accepts the Fulbright Student Award prior to being notified of their status with the DDRA program, the candidate must notify the DDRA office immediately. Um, if after consultation with the Fulbright Student Program, we determine that they've already extended funds on the student, for example, the candidate already attended a pre-departure orientation or was issued grant funds, then uh, they will automatically be ineligible for DDRA award at the time. So essentially, if you are interested in applying for the DDRA this year and you are also currently applying for the Fulbright Student Program, please note that you will only be able to accept one award if you do receive both of them. And also note that the notification timelines may be different. So just keep that in mind. And if any questions come up, you should definitely speak with your project director, but you cannot hold two federal grants in the same fiscal year. Okay, so as we all know, there must be a project director appointed for any institution who wishes to apply for DDRA funding for their doctoral students. So the project director must review the student's application transmittal in G5. G5 is the Department of Education's application system. So they must review the application form, the CV, the project description, the application narrative, and it must comply with the guidelines. So please be sure to very carefully review the application guidance and pay attention to the rest of this webinar to hear more. Project directors must review the application bibliography. One foreign language reference form must be provided. There should also be three graduate student reference forms, transcripts, letters of affiliation, and host country materials, and a institutional review board or IRB narrative if applicable. Applicant roles and responsibilities. So we have the institution, we have the fellows, and we also have the referees. For the institution, which we've mentioned a couple of times, is the principal candidate for the DDRA. Uh, they must attend the DDRA technical assistance webinar. Um, there must be an appointed project director who is registered in the G5 application system. The project director will ensure that fellowship application materials are made available to students. The project director will accept and screen applications in accordance to its own technical and academic criteria. Project directors include student applications with the institutional application and administer the grant and disperse funds. So it's really important that your institution has an appointed project director as soon as possible if there is not already someone in that place. And again, uh, we are really happy to assist with that for any institutions who might be listening and they don't have a project director or any uh, potential DDRA fellows who are trying to figure that out. Please let us know. Responsibilities of the fellows, you must contact the project director for institutional information. Also must register in G5 so you can complete your part of the application. You have to initiate emails to solicit references. Make sure you do that well in advance to uh, ensure that you're giving your references enough time and you can also avoid any sort of technical issues that could creep up. Submit and complete your application in G5. Submit an institutional review or IRB narrative to the project director to upload in G5, and be sure to follow up with the project director. It's possible that your institution might have several applicants, so it's really important that you be proactive and follow up with your project director as much as needed to ensure that you're meeting any internal deadlines at your institution and making sure that you are completing all of the components of your DDRA application. Lastly, referees, so people who are doing references for DDRA fellows, they will receive a reference form from the fellow. Make sure you're checking in with them to ensure that they did receive it. They will complete and submit the reference form and send the project director a copy of the reference form. And please note that for any of this, we do um, highly recommend that you are using a US server. G5 may not be able to accept docu documents that are being uploaded from non-US servers. So please be sure again to plan in advance and be uh, to your best ability on a US based server when you are uploading uploading these documents. And also be sure um, not to use any sort of international characters or non-English characters in your application because unfortunately those will not translate in the G5 system. So it could uh, provide some challenges to reading aspects of your application. 
Okay, so we have talked a lot about G5. Um, so now we're going to give you a little bit more information about uh, how that works. So first of all, the website is very simple. It's just www.g5.gov. Again, students submit individual applications to the project director using G5. Language and academic references submit forms to the project director using G5. References using service overseas may not be able to submit the forms in G5. So please plan for that. And again, um, do not use any special or non-English characters in your application uh, because those will make it harder to read. Same thing with the foreign characters that I previously mentioned. And this is really important. Please remove any personally identifiable information or PII from transcripts, including your birth date, social security number, home address, student ID numbers, anything like that, please uh, remove from your application. Uh, we do not need that information, so uh, you should be sure to remove it before it is put in G5. A couple of other technical notes. Uh, any documents that are being uploaded into G5 should be unlocked or unprotected, so G5 will be able to accept the document. The CV should include the applicant's language proficiency. The project description and application narrative and bibliography must comply with the guidelines in the application package. The application package will be posted in the application information page of the DDRA application website, so you can reference that for guidelines. Applications that exceed page limits and do not comply with the guidelines will be rejected. There is no appeal for this requirement. So again, please be sure to carefully read the application instructions and ensure that you are following all of the requirements and not going over any page requirements. Reference forms must be submitted by the referee noted by the applicant. And again, please be sure that they do not use any special or non-English characters in the document. Transcripts can be unofficial as they will need to be opened by the student and uploaded to the application. Graduate transcripts are required. Undergraduate transcripts are recommended as they can demonstrate the applicant's language and area studies and academic training. Again, please remember to remove any PII or birth date, social security number, address, et cetera, from those documents. So just to reiterate, graduate transcripts are required. Undergraduate transcripts are not required, but they are recommended because they can strengthen your application and show your language and area studies and academic training background. Letters of affiliation and other host country supporting materials may be included in the application. These are not required documents, but again, can also demonstrate the applicant's experience and training in the proposed research language and area of study. An IRB narrative is required if the proposed research involves human subjects. The application must provide a narrative to the project director to include on the ED Supplemental Information Form, SF-424. Okay, so continuing the G5 application system, fellows must select no to the question, are you registering as a fellow are you registering as a fellowship Fulbright Hayes doctoral dissertation or faculty abroad director? Please say no to that question. Fellows, please instruct the, ref the referee to print and send a copy of the reference letter and form to the project director. DDRI reference forms, fellowship applicants need to at least save a draft of the DDRA form with their name, institution, country of research, and language. After that, the references form will appear. Project directors must register as applicant and not project director in their G5 profile. The project director officially submits the Institute of Higher Education's and all eligible individual student application, reference forms, IRB narratives, and other required forms using G5. Make sure all applicants and referees hit submit to complete the application submission. So again, it's really important for any fellows who are applying to be in contact with their project director to ensure that every aspect of your application is completed and being submitted by the deadline. And sometimes institutions do have internal deadlines which may fall before our deadline. So again, please keep that in mind and be sure to reference this technical assistance webinar when you are starting to register on G5 for a couple of these really important reminders to make the process a bit smoother uh, throughout the application process. 
Department of Education eligibility screening. So the department will screen all applications for technical eligibility in accordance with the evaluation criteria public, published in the notice inviting applications and the program specific regulations of 34 CFR part 662. So the US institution eligibility, uh, there must be a registered project director and there must also be a registered unique entity ID, the UEI, formerly known as the DUNS, and the taxpayer identification number, or the TIN. Student eligibility, uh, reiterating from before, must be a US citizen or permanent resident. J1 scholars or students are not eligible. It must be in good academic standing. They must be seeking careers in teaching or world areas vital to U.S. national security. They must not be receiving any other federal awards or grants during the same time that they would be receiving DDRA funding, and they have they cannot have defaulted on federal student loans. So again, uh, students are not able to apply for this funding in independently. It's necessary for the student and the institution to coordinate activities, and both the student and the institution must complete their portions of the application. And um, students are not, uh, just to reiterate and provide some more specific, students are not eligible to receive other federal research grants. So again, the Fulbright Student Program, you cannot receive that in the same time that you are receiving a DDRA fellowship, the Boren Fellowship, any fellowships from IREX or the Japan Foundation in the same fiscal year that they receive the DDRA fellowship. And students who default on student loans are not eligible to apply. Students who receive support for more than six months are not eligible to reapply. So somebody who has already had a six month DDRA fellowship is not eligible to reapply. And for anyone who is a permanent resident or a green card holder, please note that, that typically you're not able to conduct research in a country in which you currently hold a passport because that could uh, interfere with your green card process. So that's it for the eligibility screening. I'm actually going to pass it off to Pamela to talk a little bit more about the specifics as to what the DDRA fellowship covers, uh, the funding, and what you should include in your budget. So passing off to you, Pamela. Thanks, Amy. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what DDRA covers and what it does not cover in your budgets. When you're developing your budget, the DDRA funds may include expenses such as your health and accident insurance while you're abroad, uh, books, uh, technology related to proposed research, travel within the host countries, affiliation fees, and it covers dependents who are your married, married spouse and your unmarried children under the age of 21. The funds cover the international round trip economy travel, maintenance allowance or your living expenses uh, for you and your dependents and a project allowance, again, your health and accident insurance. And we have a small administration fee that we give to of the institution, and that comprises your budget. Uh, let me speak a little bit about dependents. Um, dependents do not include common law spouses or domestic partnerships or civil unions. A spouse is a legally married couple uh, legally recognized by a state, and children must have a birth certificate. We do not cover dependence allowances for fiancés, um, girlfriends, boyfriends, <laughs> none of that, or older um, children. Uh, you must have a marriage certificate by the time of application to be eligible for a dependent allowance. And dependents must travel with the fellow the entire research period. Also, when you're creating your budget, please do not use any other figure than what is in the maintenance allowance list, and this is included in the application instruction materials. Okay, okay. what do you do not include in your DDRA budget? 
And it's an extensive list and the award does not provide funds for. And if we see these items in your budget, they will be removed. Um, it does not cover any research or related activities conducted in the United States or its territories. There are no funds provided for gifts, stipends, salary, monetary honorarium for research subjects, research assistants, or anyone other than the fellow or their dependent. Okay, I see this in budgets quite frequently and they all are removed because DDRA funds do not provide for this. Okay, reimbursement for travel not approved by the US Department of Education. So if you decide to go somewhere that's not on your list of activities, those are not reimbursable. Okay, any allowance for dependents not accompanying the fellow for the entire research period. Your dependents, the DDRA funds are available for the fellow and the dependents so that everyone can travel together. So if that person is not traveling with you, then you don't get that allowance, okay? Any travel for dependents, that is not a fund that DDRA supports. Any motorized vehicles, a car, a moped, a motorcycle, things like that, any equipment, becomes property of the federal government. So we don't want to, um, I don't want to have to go and figure out a car in Dubai. So <laughs> please do not have anything of that nature in your budget. Also, any travel or expenses not directly related to the project will not be approved. All expenses, all expenditures due to changes in your itinerary and or your grant agreement are the responsibility of the fellow. Now, this one comes up quite frequently. Uh, any passport, visa, photos, or identifying documents for clearance, the federal government cannot pay for any of your uh, identifying documents as a part of our programs, okay? Any pre-award travel you have to take to obtain a visa or research permission is not a cost that can be supported by DDRA because that is you as receiving your identifying documents, which the federal government cannot pay for that. Any physical examinations, immunizations, or other medical expenses related to um, your issues, the, the DDRA program cannot pay for those. We cannot pay for tuition or other fees for study or projects conducted in the US. So any courses that you're taking at your home university is not an expense that can be covered by DDRA or any obligations not incurred within the grant period. So if you have a cost, say, um, uh, that you need to travel to get back to your location and then travel abroad, those costs are with, not within the grant period and you have to bear those costs, not the DDRA program funds. Now let's begin to talk about what are the requirements for receiving points in the application? So when we have the uh, your applications, they are reviewed by world area specialists in foreign languages and area studies from higher education institutions, government agencies, and non-government agencies throughout the U.S., sometimes around the world. And they determine the technical scores in accordance with the competitive preference priorities, the selection criteria, which are the quality of the proposed project and the qualifications of the applicant. Now this year, we have some changes in our point structure. 
So we have, um, and I'll talk more about that in just a second, but the quality of proposed project will be worth 76 points this year, and the qualifications of applicants will be worth 24 points. So it's still 100 points for the main selection criteria, and our three competitive preference priorities are worth two points each for six points. So if you have a perfect application, it will be worth 100 points. Okay, let's look at the new point structure for this year. So the quality of the proposed project is a maximum of 74 points. And as you can see, the hypothesis statement, your research questions is now worth 29 points. So that's nearly a third of the points are in the proposed uh, hypothesis and your research question. So it's a very critical part of the application now. Your theoretical issues, um, your originality in literature is worth 10. Your preliminary research, 10. Justification for overseas research is worth 10. Dissemination plan is worth five and guidance and supervision from your advisor and committee is worth 10 points. Now, that means that the qualifications of the applicants is worth now 26 points. And as you can see, your, um, your academic record still worth 10, area studies is worth 10, but now the language proficiency is worth one point and we'll talk about that a little more in depth in a moment. Um, but there is a change uh, coming. We are proposing new regulations um, on this question. And so we felt it uh, best to reduce the points in this category. And then your ability to conduct research overseas is worth five points. So maximum 100 points still remains. We just have redistributed the points in the application. Okay, so let's talk about what it is that your peer reviewers will be reviewing and looking for in your documents. Let's take a look at the hypothesis statement. It's now worth 29 points. I can't emphasize more how important this is to your application. So we're going to be looking at if the proposal is well organized, is your question, your research excellently conceived, and are your research question or hypothesis clear? And you need to make a distinction whether you're using a hypothesis or you're using research questions both are valid but they must be clear and importantly as well your justification of your research methods has to be strongly conceived okay so make sure that you are talking about your research methods what you're doing your sampling your methods, all of that needs to be very strong and very clear. Okay. The second uh, question is on your literature. Do you have a knowledge of the relevant literature in the field? Have you analyzed and articulated the potential impact of your research? And do you demonstrate originality in your project. That's what the reviewers are going to be looking for and that your, um, that your literature review, your citations are really um, current or are relevant to the field, okay? Your preliminary research is worth 10 points. What have you done uh, prior to this fellowship to establish um, a plan for how you're going to conduct your research. So here we're really looking for, have you had experience in the field already doing research on your topic and that it's clear how you will conduct this portion of your research? Okay. Next is the justification for overseas research. It's worth 10 points. 
And here you need to provide a clear justification for why you need to go overseas to do this research and that the applicant demonstrates appropriate connections in the host country. Do you have um, affiliations? Do you have connections in the field that can send you uh, letters of support or affiliation letters? That's what's going to be um, reviewed in that section. The next is your dissemination plan. How are you going to share your research um, in the host country as well as stakeholders and the academic community? Um, so you need to have a plan on how you need to do that, but make sure that you are also sharing the results of your research with your host country affiliates or the support system you have there. The next section is on the guidance and supervision from the advisor and committee. It's worth 10 points. And here we see sometimes that um, this section may be overlooked, but it is worth 10 points, 10% 10 of the application. So this section, you need to have a plan for how your advisor is going to guide and supervise your work, what type of uh, communication structure that you're going to have with the um, advisor and your committee while you're abroad and that the advisor is engaged and invested in the applicant and that they have the support of the committee. Okay, those are very important points that you need to make in your application that we have seen reviewers um, question applicants on over and over again. Okay. All right. Next is the first section is about your project. The next section is about you. And we are looking for the best and brightest in DDRA. And so we're going to ask questions about your experience and your um, overseas experience. So the first question in this section is around your academic record. Do you have a strong uh, GPA? Um, are you is here where you can talk about you being a recipient of previous fellowships? Do you have um, publications? Do, have you done work in the field um, around this? Okay, so this is very important. The next is on your area studies academic record. Okay, the first one is on your general GPA and your academic record. The next question is, are you strong in area studies, international studies, language studies? Um, do you, how have you demonstrated that in your CV and in your academic record? Have you taken um, academic courses in area studies, international studies? Um, do you have language uh, courses? They're going to be looking at your transcripts for that. And so if it's recommended that you have both your undergraduate and your graduate transcripts so that they can have your reviewers can have a complete picture of your academic strength. Okay. The next question is on language proficiency and we have reduced this to one point and we have um, we are now in uh, looking at revising the regulations for language proficiency. And so um, we thought it was appropriate to reduce the amount of points here while we um, work on the regulations for this. So now this is worth one point. Applicants need to ensure that they are providing information about their language proficiency 
um, and that you should have a high level of competency in your foreign language. If you are only using English, you will not be eligible for DDRA. Um, and your language proficiency and your language needs to be, um, uh, you need to be proficient in the language of the countries you are attending. Okay, so if you're going to Mexico, we would expect you to be, uh, have a high level of proficiency in Spanish. Okay. Um, and even if uh, the, the language used in the country is English, you would need to have a foreign language to be eligible for DDRA. Okay. So we want to make sure everyone understands that uh, question this year that you need to provide information on your language proficiency and the use of English only is prohibited and will make your project ineligible. Okay. Um, the next question, the final question in the main selection criteria is on the applicant's ability to conduct research overseas. And this is going to be worth five points. And this information comes a lot from um, your record, your CV, but also what the uh, references have indicated about your ability to conduct research abroad. And so we look at that information to determine whether the applicant demonstrates that they have the ability to perform this research as proposed. So we're looking to see can you hit the ground running in the country that you are proposing to conduct research? Okay, it's worth five points. And it's important that you don't discount any selection criteria in the application because um, five points here, one point there, three points there, seven points there, it all adds up. And there are 100 points in the main selection criteria. So, and applications usually score in the, uh, that are successful score in the 90s. So you need to make sure that you're responding to all the selection criteria um, in a full and complete manner. Okay, let's take a look again at the absolute priorities, um, which are around the geographic regions. And what we mean by an absolute priority is if your application does not focus on one of these regions, um, it is not eligible. So if you have a, a topic that looks at the um, Queen Charlotte's reign um, and the British monarchy, that would not be eligible because that is only focusing on a uh, Western European nation, the, the Great Britain, okay? That's not focused on one of these um, areas. But if you were looking at, um, international um, uh, cocoa trade between uh, Africa and uh, South America, those are eligible uh, research areas because you're looking at Africa and you're looking at the Western Hemisphere, okay? Um, also, it excludes the U.S. and its territories, so you cannot propose research as a focus for one of the U.S. territories, Virgin Islands, um, Guam, uh, Puerto Rico, for example. Okay, so make sure that your research is going to be focused on one of the areas of these uh, that are listed. Okay. And our competitive preference priorities, um, 
The first one is around your language. And Amy talked about this earlier, that it focuses on any modern language except French, German, or Spanish. Now, let me clarify. That does not mean that in competitive preference priority three, if you are using Spanish as your language, you would still be eligible for the point there. It's just if you're using Spanish only as your language, you would not be eligible for the competitive preference priority here. If you had Spanish and Quechua, because you were looking at the, the peoples um, who speak Quechua, and that was one of your language, you could be eligible for this competitive preference priority because you're using a language other than Spanish. Okay, so I want to make sure everyone understands that distinction. Competitive preference two, your research project conducted in one of these fields listed on the slide. However, if your project is focused on, say, anthropology, that is not one of the disciplines listed in the competitive preference priority, and you would not be eligible for points in this section. Okay. Now, competitive preference priority three is, as Amy said, we started this last year, and it's consistent with the secretary's uh, priorities to promote access for um, these institutions. And it is if you are in, at one of these uh, types of institutions, you're at a historically black college or university, you're at a minority serving institution, or you're at a tribal college or university, you are eligible for the two points. And we have a list of those institutions who fall within these categories. So you don't have to um, necessarily address this in your application. Your institution type will let us know, and we have the information on these um, institutions that qualify for the um, competitive preference priority. Okay, now it's time for application tips, and I'm going to turn it over to the lovely Carla White to talk about some application tips. Carla? Thanks, Pamela. Some of this um, information that I will be repeating is information you heard early on, but please, please, please pay attention to it. When you write in your proposal, do address all the selection criteria in the order listed in the application packet. Provide detailed research plan with the plan. You provide a detailed research plan. Include sufficient details about your research goals. Prep your re reference. Prep your reference and give them plenty of time to write you a glowing recommendation. Yes. Avoid grammar, grammatical errors or specific pro professional jargon acronyms. Always ask friends outside your field to read your proposal and provi provide feedback. Use a persuasive decision, description of your research and be clear and concise. And remember that your entire application counts, not just your project narrative. When you're writing your proposal, do not wing it. Be clear in what you propose to do. And do not wait until the deadline to contact the people you would need the letters of support or complete official forms. Do not write or send in your proposals at the last minute. I will emphasize that again. Do not write and send in your proposal at the last minute. Do not propose doing research in a country in which you will need to speak another language and have no evidence of having learned that language. And if you are re reapplying, do not ignore the suggestions that the reviewers made on your last application. Submitting your application. Register early. If you are applying as a fellow 
as Amy told you earlier, but your institution does not have a project director, please work with your sponsor program office or the graduate studies office to get someone assigned to submit the application on your behalf. We cannot emphasize it enough to remove all of your personal information from your documents, such as your transcripts, anything personal, please remove. Do not wait until the last minute to submit. The G5 system will shut down applications at 11.59 p.m. in Washington, D.C. time. No exceptions. If, if at all possible, we would target three days before the due date to submit your applications to avoid any issues. Again, the new deadline time is 1159 on April the 11th. And that is Washington, D.C. time. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, please contact Dr. Pamela Maymer, Amy, Mary or myself at ddra at ed.gov. We also have our DDR webpage listed, and there will be a live Q&A session on March the 8th at 3 o'clock p.m. Washington, D.C. time. If you have any technical assistance with G5 uploading your applications or anything, the number is 1-888-336-8930, and it's listed. And again, the application deadline is April 11th, and it's 11.59 p.m. Washington, D.C. time. Thank you again for listening. We look forward to receiving your applications by April the 11th. Pamela and Amy. Thanks. And we look forward to having your applications in by the due date and time. And we wish you all the best and look forward to your applications. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with your applications. Take care. Thank you.